This is the IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series brought to you by the Distinguished Visitors Program. The Distinguished Visitors Program delivers tools for individuals at all stages of their professional careers through visits to chapters, offering opportunities for individual interactions, and to the membership through webinars by respected professionals. We have distinguished visitors around the world who cover machine learning, cybersecurity, robotics, big data, cloud computing, blockchain, and cryptography, among others. Chapters can request a distinguished visitor on computer.org slash distinguished dash visitors. The Distinguished Visitors Program is able to pay up to $1,000 for a visit to a chapter, but by working with other nearby chapters to develop a tour, that amount can be increased. So when your chapter is planning its next event, think of the Distinguished Visitors Program. Welcome, everyone, to our Distinguished Lecture webinar series. My name is Kerry Cosby, and I'm the Chapters Manager at the IEEE Computer Society. I oversee our more than 600 professional and student chapters around the world and manage our Distinguished Visitors Program. I'd like to take care of some housekeeping tasks. You can ask your questions in the Q&A panel. Dr. Mead and Dr. Shoemaker will answer as many questions as they can following the presentation. When you're writing your questions, if it relates to a particular slide, please do your best to reference that slide in the question. The webinar is being recorded in the recording, and the slides will be made available after the webinar. Software engineering and development require collaboration and knowledge of other areas of computing, such as cybersecurity. The Computer Society provides communities, events, and other resources that enable continued learning and exploration in these areas. This year alone, over 1,000 articles have been published on cybersecurity in the Computer Society Digital Library, and the IEEE, Computer S IEEE Security and Privacy publishes the latest trends on cybersecurity. Furthermore, you can connect and grow with other, cyber, with other security professionals via our technical committee on security and privacy. More information will be shared after the webinar. You can also learn more at computer.org. Today's webinar provides a crossover look at software development and cybersecurity, secure sourcing on, of COTS products, a critical missing element in software engineering education, presented by Dr. Nancy Mead and Dr. Dan Shoemaker. Dr. Mead and Dr. Shoemaker's discussion centers on the challenge and the potential for solutions for the integration of secure supply chain risk management into development projects and incorporation of related content into conventional, conventional software engineering education. Development pro projects and software engineering degree programs are typically focused on the development of software artifacts. As a result, development edu slash education does not always include methods to ensure that code in commercial off the shelf COTS products has not been compromised during the sourcing process. Dr. Mead and Dr. Shoemaker will discuss good practices and education based on the established principles, which can form the basis of comprehensive approach to address the problem, the source, secure sourcing of COTS products. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Nancy R. Mead is a fellow of the Software Engineering Institute at and an adjunct professor of the software engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Her research areas are security requirements engineering and software assurance curricula. The Nancy Mead Award for Excellence in Software Engineering Education is named for her. Prior to joining the SCI, the, uh, Dr. Mead was a senior technical staff member at IBM Federal Systems, where she spent most of her career in the development and management of large real-time systems. She's developed and taught numerous courses on software engineering topics, both at universities and professional education courses. Dr. Dan Shoemaker is a professor and graduate di program director at the University of Detroit Mercy. He received a doctorate from the University of Michigan in 1978. He taught at the Michigan State at Michigan State University and then moved to the directorship of the information systems function for the medical school at MSU. He held joint teaching and department chair position at Mercy College of Detroit. 
When Mercy was consolidated with the University of Detroit in 1990, he moved to the business school to chair their Department of Computer Information Systems. He was also a consultant in the Detroit area on the CMM slash CMMI. Dr. Mead and Dr. Shoemaker, I'd like to pass the floor to you. Thanks, Gary. Well, it's great to be speaking with Dan again. Yep. Um, we actually do speak quite a bit. Yep. And my, uh, That's my intelligent fondest, comment. One of my fondest memories of Dan was when we were at a conference together and they were presenting the award that has my name attached to it. And Dan said, well, when I heard all of this uh, description about the award and about you, I thought that, that you had died and that this was a kind of a memorial thing. And um, so I said, no, I'm still very much around. And that continues to be the case. Uh, so Dan, a, a pleasure. When yep. I start, started looking into this topic, I said to myself, well, we're hearing a lot about ransomware. It's all over the news. Um, companies are being attacked. We now have Congress interested in it, although, as usual, no two people exactly agree, and they feel like they have to do something. They just need to figure out what the something is. And so I thought, well, here we're talking about supply chain risk management. Am I actually going to find anything when I go out and try to look for evidence that this is happening? We do a lot when it comes to discussing how to avoid supply chain risks, and we have a lot of methods, as you'll see. Uh, but is this actually happening? And uh, so when I went into it and delved a little further, I was astonished to find out that, yes, a lot is happening. So I've got three little case studies that I'm going to describe and then um, hand it over to Dan for a while to, to talk about what he thinks about these. For each of these case studies, I've got uh, a title, and then I have the larger resource that it comes from. And the resource will be in the references that you'll see at the end. And uh, by the way, the slides uh, will be available to you. Also, Dan and my contact information if you would like to get in touch or collaborate, which would be great. So the first one of these uh, I found in a much larger document with a treasure trove of supply chain attacks and potential attacks. Uh, it's uh, a document that was developed by the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity. And the title of the larger document is the NISA Threat Landscape for S Supply Chain Attacks. Um, they do a nice job of summarizing the types of attacks and give examples that include malware infection, social engineering, brute force, exploiting vulnerabilities, exploiting configuration vulnerabilities, uh, open source, exploits those in a way those are easier because you can see the source code and counterfeiting um, and so they they categorize these and discuss how those attacks might take place and then how they might be avoided so the first one of these attacks is uh, described in the integrated development environment provided by apple uh, called Xcode. It's used for developing OS and iOS applications, so it could be pretty common. Um, and what the analysts found was that there was a malicious project that could be used to infect developers with a backdoor. Of course, a backdoor allows an attacker to get in later on, maybe retrieve data, um, maybe modify code, maybe modify data or, or otherwise do damage. And so when the project build is launched, they could actually run a script 
uh, that would do whatever they chose. It's not known whether this was ever actually executed before it was discovered by the security experts. So there are two ways that attacks can be discovered or potential attacks. One is by experts and the other is when it actually happens. So um, in that regard, ransomware in some ways is a good example because we see when it actually happens. Um, but you could find the potential of it by actually looking at software or environments. Um, the second case study, this was an interesting one too, uh, was one that I came across by way of the Wall Street Journal. So they have a, a little newsletter that talks about cybersecurity that comes out almost on a daily basis. Um, and that gave me one reference, and from there I went to a couple of other references. It's almost like any research project where you start off with one thing and then, then you go on to something else, and it really leads you down a path that's very interesting. Uh, so this little article, which was actually uh, in Insider Pro, is called Forget the Users, the threat starts in the software supply chain. Uh, the first example is one that we've all heard of, and that's uh, solar winds. So in this kind of an attack, the actors infiltrate an actual application, change the source code, uh, hide the malware, and then downstream, when users actually get the software, uh, they find that the malware has been distributed and is starting to cause damage. So in this case, uh, the original victim, which would be somebody in the development process, is not the target. The target is the end user. And if you know enough about the, the class of end users, uh, you can focus these uh, pretty well. And solar winds. Um, the, the company, which was used as a subcontractor by a number of organizations, uh, was pushing this out without realizing it. Uh, and so that's a, a really public one, um, although maybe not from my point of view, not necessarily the most interesting example. And that one has actually occurred. Uh, the third one that I thought was really intriguing was uh, self-reported. And um, it was an analyst who had done, with, with uh, help from a colleague, an ethical hack. And by an ethical hack, I mean that he either had permission from the companies to attempt to hack their code or their applications, or uh, the company was offering what's called a bug bounty, and that is uh, a sum of money for finding defects. Uh, so in, in both cases, uh, he w was not doing anything illegal, and of course, cautions anybody else who might be thinking of this um, not to do it illegally, because then, you know, then you're into the uh, criminal realm. But what he did was was okay, even though the companies didn't know exactly how he was going about it. Uh, and it was uh, really interesting because it applies to a wide variety of programming languages and as a consequence applied to a wide variety of organizations. Uh, he ended up being able to hack into 35 organizations including Apple, Microsoft, uh, Shopify, which is a large Canadian uh, online retailer, PayPal. Now that was really scary to me because I use PayPal a lot. And the idea of PayPal being hacked into when we think that's safer than using a credit card, that was, <clears throat> that was pretty scary. And then others like um, Netflix, Yelp, and Uber. The way he did this 
was by looking at dependencies for projects and uh, installers that come with them. And after some analysis, he found that internal package names are exposed during the build process. So by looking at the build process, he could understand what internal packages were being used by the organization. He also found some in what was supposed to be an area for private use. And usually they had names that made it pretty obvious who the users were. For example, the PayPal uh, packages had names include, in, that included PayPal in the name. And so he said to himself, well, what if I created a package to my own liking and put it in a public area rather than a private area, would that get package get picked up instead? And the further activity that he found was that there tended to be version numbers. So if he put a package with the same name in a public area with a higher version number, the search engine that was being used would think it was more recent and it would pick that one up instead. And that one was the one that he used to find out uh, what company was using the package. And if he had been a malicious intruder, he could have done a lot more damage. But once he got enough information, then he reported it to the company in question uh, in some cases, and it turned out maybe not the most lucrative thing in the world, but it turned out that some of these bug bounties were as much as $30,000. So if you find enough, enough of them, um, this could be profit making, but I suspect that this person just kind of does it as a uh, interesting intellectual challenge on the side. So those are um, three examples of what, what's going on. I thought this particular one uh, was really clever, although it takes somebody with uh, very good analytical skills and a lot of knowledge to be able to pull it off. What we don't know is how many other things like that are lurking out there. So with those three as examples, and once again, all three of them have references that you'll see at the end. Let me hand it over to Dan to comment on whether he thinks these are a real problem or maybe nothing to worry about and what his take on it is. So Dan, over to you. Well, I mean, you need to worry about it. Um, the solar winds hack could have been the most uh, egregious national security breach in the history of the country, uh, given that uh, the, uh, the application that was compromised more or less is a network monitor for every uh, system in the federal government. Uh, and so the folks that uh, compromised that uh, particular application basically got access to anything we're doing right now. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd say that's a fairly serious problem. Um, everything you've talked about, and it's really fascinating examples, are basically examples of that uh, kind of genre of, of cybersecurity attack. Um, and it's a really obvious attack vector that, um, you know, we don't have that many examples that we've actually dug up. But if, you know, you're thinking about attacking companies, individuals, or even the country at large, it seems like a really obvious way to go. And so we, you know, in answer to your sort of question, we really don't know how compromised we might be, but we could be very compromised because basically we outsource an awful lot of the stuff we do. Uh, and once we do that, once it goes offshore, we lose track of where it went. Um, for instance, the solar wind, solar winds hack was through a, uh, basically by compromising the update server. And rumor has it, and I don't, again, I'm not, this is not 
misinformation. You know, I, it just that what I'd heard was that the server password was secured by uh, SolarWinds1234. Uh, and of course, once uh, the servers, I mean, once the pack, the update has been compromised by inserting a few useful, you know, uh, features that nobody knows about, um, it's integrated into the main, I mean, into the running code. And what you basically now uh, have is you own the, the uh, you know, the uh, target. Um, I view this from a basically security standpoint. I used to be a software engineer, and then until I went over to the dark side uh, and got into security. Um, and, you know, it's really a, a strategic problem at the very top that could be a national security threat. It's the reason why Congress is looking into it, um, because basically we don't, we don't know what we've got. And, you know, in this era of faster, cheaper, better, you buy it off the shelf. And so uh, basically what we're buying are an infinite number of pigs in a poke um, that might be secure. They might not be secure. We really ought to trust them. And since, you know, I don't think you should trust anybody, uh, we have to have come up with some mechanism to be able to tell what we got and when we got it. And so back to you. Um, you know, perhaps you can give us some idea about approaches. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we've both been thinking about this for a while. And by the way, I don't think you're on the dark side, Dan. You might be looking into the dark side, but you're not part of the dark side. I hope that you're not actually hacking into anything. In any case, um, so the question there raises is how do we address these risks? Um, we hear a lot about supply chain risk management. There are guidelines out there. Uh, there are some pretty good documents from NIST where, where you can go in and use that as a, as a guide. And there are uh, others, other federal documents as well. Um, plus, as I mentioned, uh, some in, in Europe. So it's not that we don't have ideas. Uh, I think the problem is that people either don't develop a, a supply chain risk management plan, uh, or if they do, they don't do a thorough job of it and then follow up with executing the plan, which, and you know, I preach about this all the time, it's not just a one-time thing. It's something that you have to visit during every step of an activity. We know about risk management. We have risk management techniques. But if you only focus on one aspect of risk, you will not see all the problems. For example, one company that I uh, worked with had a risk analysis, and all they looked at were the management risks, cost and schedule. Now, those are important, but they're not the only things to look at. They weren't looking at their cybersecurity risk at all. And ditto, when people buy COTS products, they may not be looking at uh, all of the risk that goes along with those products, the way they're being developed. Uh, the companies that they're working with, what visibility they have into the processes that are being used. So the question for us, both as um, technologists and educators, is how do we improve that? Uh, on a corporate level, you can work with uh, companies or organizations like your government to help them do a better job of managing this documenting their practices, executing them, getting them reviewed, et cetera, putting them in contracts. Um, turning to the education side, we want to ask ourselves, how does it fit into software engineering education? Well, turns out, and we've both looked at education curricula for many years, turns out that the main topics appear. So 
these are not topics that are not being discussed at all, but they're not necessarily being discussed with uh, this kind of supply chain risk in mind. Um, some of the work that, that you've done, which is uh, really groundbreaking, uh, teaching the material and uh, which others have started to follow up on, shows um, clearly that when students are made aware of supply chain risks, they do a much better job of identifying them. If they have a, a plan, a supply chain risk management plan as part of their uh, course project, for example, they do a much better job with it than if they're just told to think about risks in general. Uh, so where it fits in, I think, is in all four of the topics, as you know, with my interest in requirements, um, specification is certainly of interest to me. And uh, we need to look at, at that across the board. So we've got requirements, we've got um, design specification, we've got specifications in a sense that appear in a contract uh, with vendors and suppliers. And I know you're going to want to talk about that. Um, then as we saw in some of these case studies, we've got problems that surface during integration. So we shouldn't just talk about integration from the, the point of view of large software development projects that are being developed within one organization. We need to look at it through all, this, all the steps. <clears throat> if we have subcontractors who in turn have subcontractors and somebody at the bottom of the pile is picking up a COTS product, all of that needs to be looked at because it's all going to be involved ultimately in the integration activity. Um, but I know you've thought about this a lot too. And with your involvement with uh, capability maturity, I'll bet you've thought about it from that point of view as well. Not, not to mention uh, program management because once again, management is a, a big focus of yours. Um, so why don't you, uh, Dan, give us your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the, the 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 important, the only thought you really ought to have in mind is with a COTS product is it's already developed. Mm -hmm. um, and so the traditional waterfall, um, you know, kind of view uh, is sort of kind of got to get truncated a bit because you're not doing any designing or coding. That was done 10 years ago in India or something like that. Um, and so the question is basically how you create visibility into the product that you currently have, which may be 10 million lines of code, which may be a little bit difficult mm -hmm. considering the fact that the code you gotta find is maybe 10 or 11 lines. Um, and so what you basically have to be able to do is find some way to um, kind of establish top-down uh, visibility uh, and essentially control any upward integration process uh, that was used to create the product. Um, that involves at the bottom of the food chain, uh, considerable reviews, testing, that sort of thing to make sure that the modules that are moving up the integration ladder are been properly vetted and can be trusted. Uh, but uh, the bottom line from, uh, you know, the security perspective basically is control. And control is essentially imposed by a framework of controls that you create. And in that respect, it's an elegant design product project, no different than, a, a, you know, creation of a piece of software. Uh, and those controls basically are aimed at ensuring that uh, you know at any point in time in the process what the code looks like. Uh, you know, and, and what the product essentially looks like in terms of its um, trustworthiness. Um, and, you know, that essentially is a project management problem. Um, the other side of things, the capability maturity part you were talking about, is that nobody out there, and I mean, you, you, you nailed it when you said that uh, this isn't something that people think about much uh, in the industry. 
Um, but, you know, the bottom line basically is we're not going to get to where we need to get to if we want to actually be secure uh, in a, you know, one giant leap. And so it gets back to your friend Watts Humphrey and all the folks at SEI at the beginning there who talked about staged approaches to um, the implementation of secure supply chain um, oversight. And, you know, that basically means that you have to take it in little steps uh, that build on each other. Uh, and that's the capability of maturity development, you know, from uh, not define to informally practice to manage to optimize. Um, and, you know, there are there's actually a framework for doing that, which is the CMMC. Um, that's quite popular right now with the uh, at least with the DOD. Um, and I'm sure that the folks at SEI sooner or later will come out with something like that too. Uh, but basically, supply chain practice is badly in need of a uh, you know model uh, for best practice. Um, the two that currently exist, and there's one really excellent one that I highly recommend, is NIST IR double seven double six seven six two two. Sorry. Uh, they have incorporated supply chain risk management in uh, another NIST standard, which is NIST 800-161. But 7622 is 10 principles of best practice that, uh, you know, actually form a very useful basis for supply chain risk management. Um, and I might add that's sort of what we teach in the class that I teach. Uh, back to you. Well, that, that brings up a good point, which I should have mentioned earlier when we started talking about education. Um, some of Dan's course materials are available for free download from the SEI website. And if you contact me, I can send you the link for that. We've also written a couple of papers. Uh, one short viewpoint paper uh, appeared in IEEE Security and Privacy. And then we subsequently had uh, two conference papers. One was uh, a workshop paper at ICSI. And coming up in January, we'll have uh, a, a full paper to pre be presented at the HICS conference. Unfortunately, we won't get to go to Hawaii for it, but the conference is online, virtually, and uh, most interesting to our audience, it's free. So go to the HICS, H-I-C-S-S website. Um, maybe the registration information is already out there. If it isn't, it will be free in uh, early January. And then the other thing worth mentioning, there is a uh, cyber body of knowledge activity that's being undertaken in the UK. Uh, we developed uh, and identified a set of case studies for classroom use. The case studies follow a standard format and uh, in many cases have example solutions, instructor notes, and uh, directions to the students. So we're starting to accumulate some resources to address this, even though there's still a long way to go from both uh, an educational and a um, practice perspective. Uh, so let me get your thoughts on this, Dan. Is this something that would be a separate course? I know you have it as a, a series of lectures. Um, is it a separate discipline? Do we see this as a, a specialization within the degree program? How do you think this might roll out? Well, I mean, it depends on uh, the kind of uh, what we call it SCRIM. So I'm using an, an acronym. Supply chain risk management uh, represents in terms of a threat. Um, you know, it's no point in wasting a lot of time on something that's going to kind of come and go. But uh, the general impression is as long as we outsource uh, and develop up the supply chain, uh, it's going to be an issue. If that's an issue, it really ought to be addressed in education. Um, the uh, we currently teach a course in it, which is a complete self-contained, um, you know, kind of front-to-back 
your friend the uh, supply chain risk management process um, based around uh, what amounts to emerging best practice. This course was developed uh, originally under a grant from uh, the Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, and I believe it's only taught by us and the people at the National Defense University, but I may be wrong uh, since I have really not, really not been plugged into that. Um, and so at a minimum, it might, it's a course. It really is part of the, the field of software engineering because obviously you're talking about ways to make better software. Um, but, you know, it really, it also has the same, <clears throat> more of the kind of, I don't know what the right word is, uh, process orientation that you see that SEI pioneered uh, than it is the actual nuts and bolts of making software. Um, because like I said, it's already made. Um, and, you know, given the fact that software is a commodity and it's really an industry now, it's not something where it was back when, you know, we were younger, uh, and, you know, where it was a straight up development process. Um, it seems to justify using some you know, teaching it some of the process aspects, best practice aspects, whether it's a discipline or not, it's another question. Um, I kind of, you know, I'm now that I'm spending my time in the, on the dark side, and I always view myself as sort of Darth Vader. Uh, uh, the the uh, you know, there is sort of a need to individualize uh, the adversary uh, as a uh, topic. Uh, of conversation. I know back in the good old days, we used to make it, and if it ran, we were overjoyed. Um, but now that it's, you know, you've got a bad guy out there, and I mean, it's the bad guy has been an extremely successful person. $500 billion uh, is the price of or the cost of exploitation in 2015. Um, by 2020, we did improve it all the way up to, to two trillion dollars of loss uh, as a result of this sort of, you know, uh, basically cyber type incidents. And and the estimate is by Microsoft is it'll be up to two thousand by 2024. It'll be up to six trillion dollars worth of loss. Which to put that in perspective for you is the gross national product of England, France, and Germany uh, that are essentially going out of our uh, economy as a result of cyber security, um, our lack of, of interest in and knowledge of proper cybersecurity practice. Um, the problem with uh, the um, uh, supply chain uh, community is that there are always three participants in the process. You've got a customer who essentially gets the code you got a supplier who supplies the code, and you got an integrator that integrates the code. And in every box in the supply chain, except for the bottom of the supply chain and the eventual customer, uh, every practitioner uh, in that box is all three of those things at once. And the body of knowledge that's involved in being a customer versus a supplier versus an integrator uh, is different. And so it could be a discipline because essentially that body of knowledge has, has got to be kind of communicated to somebody out there. I like to think students, but whoever, uh, in a way that they can understand and, and kind of apply. Um, <clears throat> I've got a list of things on the slides here, malware, which we know about. Nancy covered beautifully. Counterfeits, which uh, has the Pentagon freaked out because essentially that stuff that gets into uh, components that is not actually the right, you know, it's not actually what you're buying. It's like buying a $10 Rolex, not the $20,000 variety. Breakdowns, which we in Detroit have particularly enjoyed since, uh, uh, you know, the automobile industry is pretty much at a standstill still because uh, the, of the chip shortage, chip problem, and then incapability, which is what we were talking about when we were talking about with about capability and maturity and finally just the simple errors that we've been struggling with since the 1950s in coding and you know so that basically is is the are kind of the things that motivate uh interest in studying this and also in expanding it through research and other you know means uh so that it becomes sort of common knowledge and common practice and that's basically my view in terms of whether it should be a course or a discipline. Excellent. Um, I, I 
picked up on one thing that you said early on when you mentioned the $500 billion of loss, and that's what we know about. Right. That doesn't uh, include everything that either nobody ever became aware of uh, right. or they decided not to publicize if they could get away with it. And so now some of the actions that are being talked about are for the first time requiring at least the uh, federal contractors here in the U.S. to publicize these things, to report on them. And you say to yourself, that's so basic. We, I can't believe that isn't happening already and that, that people might actually balk at doing that. Um, but unfortunately, that's uh, the state of the, the practice where we are now and so i think there's a lot to do and and we know that education is the basis for it both in software engineering but also um as you know in information systems information technology computer science and certainly on the management side which is huge so uh, great summary i i don't know i you remember back in the days of dhs when we were with build security and you know, I remember sitting around with a bunch of uh, us and we're talking about what practices we need to get into education that, you know, kind of going to be able to address the the problem of, you know, software assurance. And we all looked at each other and said, you know, that's exactly the same stuff we were teaching. We were calling it software quality assurance. Um, you know, what's the difference? Well, the difference is there's a bad guy out there. You know, somebody who basically uh, wants to profit from whatever flaws you he may find in your uh, code, uh, and we didn't have one of those before. But thanks to the internet, where everybody has access to everything, it seems like um, you know everything we do has to be uh, with the proviso that um, there's there's somebody there's an adversary out there who's looking to to do you in, uh, and you know. I don't want to, I mean, I guess you're not paranoid if people really are out to get you. And so I don't think that sounds that paranoid, uh, but it's an attitude that's basically got to carry into the pure and, and, uh, and kind of intellectually satisfying world of software development, um, you know, as kind of a back of your mind kind of consideration. Um, and, you know, it, it's, any exploitation of our infrastructure systems, particularly the SCADA systems uh, that we so blithely install without any thought about whether they might contain malicious code, uh, you know, could bring the whole country to its knees. So in a lot of ways, I'm making friends with the Amish, um, you know, because they know how to live without electricity. And, um, you know, that basically is is uh, kind of uh, something that we, I don't want to sound like Chicken Little, but, you know, something that people need to consider when they think about sort of teaching the process of of, of creating, what, is, what do we call it, programming in the large, uh, you know, creating really uh, kind of massive major software systems. Excellent. Well, with that, let's uh, wrap up. I mentioned that we have a, a few references. These are the references that went with the um, case studies that I mentioned early on in this talk. And then uh, in addition, we have about course materials and papers um, that we've written. I can provide links to those uh, for anybody who might be interested. I always um, learn something learn something when I work with Nancy and this is really great stuff you got there. I I can't wait to get at it. Well and so I learned have, a lot I'm gonna have to get out I of this first. I learned a lot working with Dan and I particularly like uh doing this joint conversation because up until now it's kind of been death by view graph from my point of view and I'm the one who's killing people with my view graph. So this has been uh, very refreshing for me, too. Yep, it's been fun. So with that, uh, I think we can uh, open it up for questions. 
All right, there are quite a few questions that are out here already. If anybody wants to add any questions, feel free to do so. Um, the first question we have, and I'm going to put this push this slide area, is can we avoid or limit security threats with a good UML modeling or with good modeling? Hey, yes, um, particularly abuse cases. Um, the, uh, that's been quite a popular little subset of, uh, you know, um, of, of at least my, my area has been, uh, trying to model up the adversary, um, uh, and, you know, adversarial actions, but what if is, is a, uh, really important thing to have in your kind of the back of your mind when you're looking at whatever strategies you're putting together. Um, like I said, abuse cases are a given, not use cases, but abuse cases, uh, are quite popular uh, with with at least the folks I hang out with. I can barely and, spell and, UML. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, as you know, my work in security requirements, that, that was one of the pieces that we looked at along with others. Um, so I think the answer is, is yes, there's, that's certainly a help. Um, but once again, keep in mind that we're talking about an entire life cycle. So just doing it one time will never be uh, sufficient. One of the okay, things that, good. sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I, no, I, was gonna, I was gonna follow on, but I, you probably got a bunch of questions, so you don't need me to talk about contracts uh, and specification, but bottom line basically is the thing that controls this, at least if it's a if it's a purchased product is the is the the contract and uh the only way you're going to be able to have any visibility about the product is through the specification and so uml supports specification and you know a detailed specification and uh you know the, in a lot of ways the lawyer is much more important than the software engineer when it comes to enforcing the security side of this yeah, true, but the software engineer has to be invite, involved in writing it. Well, most lawyers know as, about as much about software as some in, some doctors. So, you know, I mean, yeah, the software engineer is kind of important. All right, very good. Um, the next question we have, I'll push that to the slide area, is uh, please tell us how the Oh, about the links of the conference. They didn't get that one. Can you repeat that and maybe also put it uh, in the team chat if you can, and I'll send that out to, to everybody. Okay, let me see. It's the HICS conference, the Hawaii International Conference on System Science. Um, I don't have the link. Great concert, great conference I, for Hawaii in January is nicer than Detroit in January. Yeah, un unfortunately, it's only virtual. So if you go to Hawaii, you're on your own this time. Uh, and for a while, they weren't encouraging anybody to come either. Maybe I'll put um, some sand in the office here and turn up the temperature. In any case, if okay, you so just do a research, if you just do a search on Hicks. Um, the Big conference. conference webpage will come up, and then within that, you'll see uh, this upcoming conference in 2022. Do you get that, Carrie? Okay. Yes, I've got that. Thank you. I'll send okay, that directly great. to everybody. Um, the next one, and I'll push this to the slide area is refer, uh, referring back to when you were discussing the goals and the stimulus of um, of people who are, are putting in malware. They're asking, is this a game? Is this a software hooliganism? Is it spying or childish comp competition? Or is it planned damage? What What is the, the purpose for this? It's big business. I mean, you know, if I can uh, compromise uh, every one of your systems, uh, I own you. Uh, but it's gotten to be uh, the suspicion. The reason why it's gotten to be, I mean, as far back as, and I believe it's OMB, but I keep getting all those initials mixed up. As far back as 2012, they had congressional hearings about it because it really is a national security threat. Um, if you can get 
Um, I, I was telling you before we came on, the thing that alerted Congress was uh, Chinese malware started turning up or turned up in a U.S. weapon system. Um, and it got there because it had been integrated in from an outsourced, you know, offshore, um, you know, source. Uh, and, you know, like I said, if I wanted to attack the U.S., I would just underbid everybody out there uh, as a supplier. And then kind of as I developed the stuff for them, I would put in all the malware I could think of. Uh, you'll never catch it. Not You lose visibility into the process at about the second, about the subcontractor level. And some of these supply chains go down seven levels. Uh, God only knows who's programming the stuff that's basically supporting everything in the infrastructure. Uh, as long as we keep outsourcing and people allow people to do that uh, without any kind of control, uh, you know, we are more or less fat, dumb, and happy waiting for, you know, Armageddon. So, and yes. I, I think there's an indirect element to this. Um, we might outsource to to one vendor or, or one location, um, but the scenario that we talked about of getting hacked by somebody else, you know, maybe not trying to come at us directly, that is very real. Um, oh, yeah. One of the articles I was reading this morning, uh, maybe it was last night, talked about, uh, a defector from uh, a rogue country who said that in this country they had a huge focus on cybersecurity uh, and they were identifying people who were potentially good at cybersecurity and hence good at hacking um, and giving them all of the educational resources that they would need to either uh, try to take out another country or to be part of a ransomware attack and, and thus get income into this rogue country. Uh, well, it, it's, it's interesting stuff. It's, it's, it's sort of an equal opportunity thing. You can get kids, strip kitties, all the way up to Cozy Bear. Um, the Russian uh, SVC is the one that supposedly hacked solar winds. Uh, and, you know, that essentially is a state, uh, uh, what do you call it, organization? I don't know what you call the, their their uh, their spy service, but, you know, that's a state-sponsored uh, attack. Uh, and, you know, that essentially siphoned off whatever's going on out there, and nobody's exactly sure what's being, at least the last time I saw, which may have been like months ago, exactly what's being affected by uh, the solar winds problem. Um, and so, they, in fact, they put stuff in uh, the hack uh, to obfuscate the fact that it had been hacked, uh, you know, sort of thinking that as long as it's sitting in there, I got a backdoor into the kind of what amounts to all US uh, systems. Uh, and the last thing I want to do is be, uh, uh, what do you call it, discovered. And that sounds an awful lot like a strategic move not something where a kid is sort of saying, I wonder what ha what would happen if I was able to break into, you know, a, what is it, Orion, the the actual network monitor? Yes. Uh, and, I mean, like I said, anybody can do it. It's like the game the whole family can enjoy. Uh, and the fact that we're completely not, you know, not thinking about it really uh, or doing anything about it makes it, you know, kind of tempting, don't you think? I, I think, uh, again, if we look at the, the recent actions, um, so Congress is asking for the first time to have these things reported on, uh, and they're asking for companies to be able to respond to them. So they're, they're going back to things that are so basic to us, like have a valid backup that you can plug in. They're not even... Um, addressing, in my view, prevention. So if we think about the old days, we talked about resistance, uh, recognition, recovery. They're talking about recovery and a little bit of recognition. Prevention or resistance isn't even in their vocabulary yet. Yeah, it's like report when your house burns down, let us know. Right. 
um, you know, okay, but there's that problem that the house is not here anymore, um, rather than doing something about fire safety. Um, and, you know, that's this sort of reactive, uh, you know, kind of approach that we take to this thing where it's like somehow it's an act of God that, that you know, uh, there we've got malware in our uh, systems. Uh, I don't think so. But, I mean, until we start um, putting out at least the message that we need to think about and do something about this, uh, it's going to keep on, it's going to continue. And so what you're doing here, Carrie, is actually a service to, I believe, humanity. How do you like that? <laughs> One of the things we talked about is probably 20 years ago now, um, and which, again, I just saw covered in a news article, was about the railroad system uh, in the U.S. and how there is such a dependency on rail transport, commercial rail transportation, uh, and the number of trucks that you could possibly put on the road would never replace it. Uh, so 20 years ago, we were talking about the vulnerability of the rail system, and people are finally getting an aha moment where they're saying, oh, we really need to be concerned about this. It's, it's, I guess it's in the, the nature of humans, it's very hard to be concerned about things that haven't yet happened. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's an invisible threat, too. You know, it's pretty abstract to say that what I'm this entire conversation might be being listened to by Vladimir Putin himself, you know, simply because there's a piece of malware sitting in the IEEE's, uh, you know, platform. Uh, not that Vladimir would want to know what you and I had to say, but, you know, the name of the game basically is software is pretty abstract as a concept. And then the con idea that you buy stuff and you don't necessarily shouldn't trust it. Uh, is kind of negative. You know, we've had enough negative stuff already, and so I'm telling you that you could be very well be done in by something that you bought um, in good faith uh, because there's no attention paid whatsoever to uh, kind of the programming that went into it. Uh, you know, it's just something people don't get, can't wrap their mind around. But that's the role of education is to change things. And so, you know, I, I mean, you've been... Sorry. I was going to say you pioneered it, Nancy. I mean, uh, sorry, you were saying, Carrie. Well, I, was I guess that's, saying... why, that's why I'm still talking about it. <laughs> I was just going to say that maybe we take two more questions. Uh, we've, we're coming to the end of our time now. So let me um, push this one to the slide slide deck or slide area. Um, has there been any thought to developing a certification for solutions architects uh, slash program managers around the implementation or the integration of COTS products? We'd like to get a, people to just simply accept there's an issue there, first of all. But, I mean, they do have best practices. I like 7622 a lot. Um, you know, it's a uh, 10 principles, most of which are, you know, very well targeted on the you know the the it's not dualism the the three part you know issue that whenever you're talking about supply chains uh, you know the certification part wow that's you know that's going to probably require somebody to pick up the ball uh, and since we don't really recognize the problem yet I'm not sure that we're going to be getting anybody to do that the federal government is dropping. 853 on the supplier community through CMMC, CMMC. Um, and I know I'm throwing around a bunch of, but that's all the practices necessary to secure systems uh, as defined by NIST. Uh, and they require certificates, so that's a start. But individuals, you know, that sounds like a product for somebody. What do you think, Nancy? Should we go into business? <laughs> It's huge because, and we know that because we've done this kind of thing before in, in uh, software engineering. Um, I I think I need to call upon somebody with more energy. Uh, yes, I think it would be very good. Um, probably we may already have some training organizations 
thinking about it, but on a larger scale uh, in terms of something like the IEEE um, Certified Software Development Professional, CSDP, uh, that was many years of work, and it would take a similar amount of work for uh, uh, addressing this question. That being said, I would be happy to support such an initiative. Okay, and perhaps this will be our last one. How does code reuse play into this topic? And I'll push that to the slide area also. I'd say it's moot because um, some of the examples that we're seeing, in fact, in a way are uh, code reuse. You develop a, a nice package of code, you put it out there, somebody comes along and, and modifies it to make it uh, a package that contains malware. Right. So I think that's a big concern. Integration is a lot more important now in some respects than, you know, the waterfall. Um, we know we integrate everything and basically reuse is just a, is sort of an integration problem. Um, and, you know, we don't, you know, it's sort of like, well, it must be in great shape so we can, you know, when we, when we look at it, when we look at the actual integration piece uh, and, you know, Who's to say, as Nancy said, that somebody didn't alter the code uh, from clean to, you know, malicious? Uh, because, you know, it doesn't, you can't see it. If you could see it, it'd be easy. You know, there'd be a little red something in there that said, this is bad code or this is malicious. But since it's all invisible, it can be anything. And so, yes. And, and we've seen disasters resulting from reuse that were not malicious. Um, right. I think, uh, like the going back, the Ariane missile uh, or rocket explosion, that was uh, one example uh, when the Patriot system was used in Israel. That was another example where you, you tried to tweak something and use it in a different way from that which had been intended, and guess what? It doesn't always work. And there were, there were no uh, malicious actors involved in those. People were acting in good faith. So when you yeah. add malicious actors, you really uh, have a potentially huge problem. I, I'm in heavy industry out here. I mean, we've got, you know, the big three and all the Detroit stuff, and I mean, you, we're, we're looking at all that kind of lovely Pentagon and all that sort of, you know, kind of leading edge system stuff. They've got systems that go back to the dawn of time uh, that they're still using uh, and integrating or reusing something basically by integrating it into uh, one of those systems could take something that more or less has absolutely no defenses whatsoever uh, and introduce a predator that, you know, would wipe the whole thing out. So, I mean, basically, it's almost not good practice to talk about reuse in uh, an environment where you've got systems where you don't even know what systems you got, uh, which sort of describes the big three in terms of their, you know, IT structure, infrastructure. Um, so yes, reuse is an issue. Almost all everything we've talked about is an issue. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. Um, I'd like to take this moment to thank Dr. Mead and Dr. Shoemaker. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for attending. The upcoming webinars for October are The Future of Workforce by Dan Milojicic. That's now moved to October October 28th from October 14th. Um, we, that's going to be brought to you in partnership with the Corporate Liaison Program in the IEEE Santa, Santa Clara Valley section and the IEEE Computer Society chapter of Santa Clara Valley section. Um, the next one after that, or before that actually, on the 27th is going to be Why Technology Project Fail. That'll be by Steve Andrioli. This event's going to be brought to you in partnership with IT and Practice Special Technical Community. And in our standards webinar series, the IEEE Learning Technology Standards Committee in Action. Register, and we'll be sending you a link to these and future events along with the recording uh, and the slides of this webinar. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mead and Dr. Shoemaker. 
It's been a pleasure. And Nancy, it's yes, always it a pleasure was. working with you. Yes, very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you.